Luke says, For therefore be ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Indeed, indeed. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Luke, again, Luke volume 2, book of Acts. There's another disease that I think is primarily American. This is a malady, a, a, a mania, a de mental derangement that occurs primarily in the United States. I call it rapture-itis. Uh, there is a, a, a tendency by people who get caught up in this rapture to see him just around the corner. And that's fine, that God ex tells us to expect him any moment, but they also, what they end up doing is putting their feet on the desk and kicking back and say, boy, he's coming from a week from Tuesday, why pay off that mortgage? Why send our kids to college? He's coming back soon. And, um, uh, you know, many of those teenagers that came off the drug scene in the early 70s are now pastors of churches and uh, handing the churches over to their sons because time has slipped by, if you haven't noticed. There, this idea that somehow uh, 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 we're not going to be facing... First of all, it's a question of stewardship. Jesus said, occupy till I come. So it's a question of stewardship. But it's also, we need to have an expectation of persecution. Jesus promised us persecution. Don't confuse persecution with that particular period of time called the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, this is a form of arrogance. Just because I think I can prove to you the church will not go through the Great Tribulation, why should we as Americans, say, escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the 2,000 years that have passed had to endure. It's not the Great Tribulation, it's just persecution. God, Christ promised it to us. And indeed, we can expect that. Yes, and here in America. It's been predicted by some scholars that not only will the real body of Christ have to go underground in America, it's the persecution against it will be led by the denominational churches. That sounds preposterous at first. It certainly did, I'm sure, 20 years ago when J. Vernon McGee first announced that. But the more you watch the tide of our culture and the use of hate crimes, um, these Christians in Philadelphia that were attacked and discovered that 10% of the attorneys in the federal government are, are, are homosexuals. And uh, uh, when you examine what they did, all they were doing they were, you know, is, is reading from the Scripture in public. And uh, they're facing... Uh, judicial process around right, right, at this point. If you want to, what time it is, of course, you look at God's timepiece. But there are other issues we haven't had time to look at. Um, the rise of the European superstate, we didn't take a look at that, but we did when we were in Daniel. The rise of the Far East, the, the refuge in Edom, where he, the Jews will flee from Jerusalem when the Antichrist does his thing. The Battle of Armageddon, we have in detail. We'll talk about that somewhat in the next hour, or in the, uh, in the hour after next the Magog invasion, the rebuilding of the temple, and the rebuilding of Babylon. These last three things are, in effect, topics that should be touched upon in a review of eschatology. Let's just take a quick look at it. Now, we've talked about the Magog invasion, how that the Battle of Armageddon is at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. We talked about that before. And uh, we know that the temple will be standing by the middle of that week because Pe uh, Peter, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, James, Paul, and uh, uh, Jesus all talk about it. The, the, the Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 we talked about, it's classically viewed as occurring at the end of the uh, tribulation by Hal Lindsey and, and other very competent scholars on the one hand, but there are many of us that have a slightly different view. We think the Magog invasion occurs before the 70th week and uh, for a number of technical reasons. So there's that debate. But what I bring it up primarily for this reason, what we all agree on is the Magog invasion d does occur after the rapture of the church. So to the extent the Magog invasion seems to be on a horizon and many experts... Uh, in the strategic arena, I believe so, uh, then uh, that means the rapture is even closer. So that's pretty exciting. And we could talk more on that, but let's move on. The coming temple. Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 24. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 we saw. John will mention it when we get to Revelation 11. The rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. This is just, of course, a model of the, how they think it was reconstructed at one time. Here's an aerial photograph of the region taken from the northwest looking southeast, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the western wall between, you know, on the, on the side there, and, uh, which is often photographed where they go to pray and so on. Um, this, is the, this is actually not the, it's just the retaining wall that held the temple area. If you go up to the temple area, you'd go up on a right through the Mugrabi Gate and onto the, onto the platform. Um, 
Here's an aerial view of the Temple Mount with north at the top. And uh, we have the traditional view is that the, the original temple stood where the Dome of the Rock stands today. That is the official view of the, the nation Israel, but it's not the view of the scientists that have studied this carefully. Uh, there is a northern conjecture popularized by Dr. Asher Kaufman. He's a good friend. Chuck Smith and I funded his original research. Uh, he has a number of reasons why he believes that the uh, uh, temple stood about 100 meters to the north of the Dome of the Rock. There's a number of reasons he defends that view. It may, what caused a big stir many decades ago when this first surfaced is that would put the Dome of the Rock um, in that region called the uh, Court of the Gentiles. And that complies, in a sense, with the passages that we'll encounter in Revelation 11. That created quite a stir. However, there are some problems remaining. If you try to create a three-dimensional model of the temple area, you run into some problems because there's a, some, if you take the Josephus, Joseph, the Tesefta, the Mishnah, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and uh, 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 Josephus and a few other things, and try to put that together, Agrippa had a view of the Azarah, the place where they offered, uh, that just, just doesn't work. The Romans could also see from the wall what was going on in the Azarah. Azarah is that part of the temple where they did the offerings. And you can't, it just doesn't work three-dimensionally. There's also a water aqueduct, parts of which are still in place, that fed the temple, and it implies if the, if the temple stood at the Dome of the Rock, it's 21 meters too high. It would have to be further south at lower elevation because the, the, the bedrock drops going south. And the, there's also a location of a moat issue. And anyway, the, all, when you start looking at these carefully, uh, it implies that the, the temple stood south of the Dome of the Rock. Now, you need to understand a little history here. In 70 AD, of course, Jerusalem fell. In 132 AD, Bar Kokhba had his ill-fated revolt, and uh, it took the Romans about three years to get their act together. He, he actually had wiped out the 12th legion, something they never recovered from, but the Romans finally get their act together. They regained Jerusalem, but by then, Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian decides they can never re rule that land as long as there's a Jewish presence in Jerusalem. So they, they bury the entire city, plow it under, build a Roman city on top of it called Aila Capitolina, named after Hadrian's. And uh, then uh, a temple to Jupiter was built over the site of the Jewish temple. And, and uh, from Jerome's commentary on Isaiah, we know there was an equestrian statue of Hadrian installed right over the Holy of Holies. Well, the question is, where did the, was this temple built? Well, we don't know, but uh, some architects in Tel Aviv noticed something very strange. They noticed that the Dome of the Rock, the Alcaz Fountain, and the Aqsa Mosque are on a center line. And that applies to an architect, a plan of some kind, a vestige of something that stood there earlier. Tuvia Segev is the main champion. This is also a good friend. Um, up in Baalbek, Lebanon, the, the uh, Romans built a temple. And uh, as people who study how, how the uh, Romans built temples, they had an architectural pattern. This looked better from the top. They had a temple, a rectangular temple, a courtyard, and then a polygon or circular structure called a rotunda at the other end. And... Uh, they put their, their statues and stuff in, the, in this uh, courtyard in between. If you take the temple at Baalbek exactly as it's sitting there, it is built around a hexagon, not an octagon, but other than that, if you take that, go to the, uh, the, the, the uh, Aila Capitoline or, or Jerusalem and put it there, it fits perfectly, the, uh, the, the situation that's there. The Al-Aqsa Mosque has been rebuilt six times due to earthquake damage. It's not exactly the same size anymore. The Dome of the Rock is an octagon, not a hexagon. But other than that, it fits perfectly. And that implies then that the temple, that the, the uh, right over the uh, statue of Hadrian would be, was, is over the Alcaz Fountain, which is stating there. So that there seems to be increasing evidence that that's the correct conjecture. So this, this temple was, and Jerusalem was built by the same guy who built the one in Lebanon at about the same time. And so Hadrian's statue is right over the Holy of Holies, it would seem, and so we think we know where that is. And so this is the, what I'll call the southern conjecture. The traditional view is the middle, and Asher Kaufman's view is the north. So we've got these three different views that uh, will only be resolved if we can get good access and uh, take care of it. This is an infrared photograph flying over the Dome of the Rock, and we notice a pentagonal structure underneath it, which implies that it was part of the Antonia Fortress, by the way. to give you a long, a long answer to this in a quick... Um, if you take an infrared f profile of the wall from Mount of Olives, we notice a couple of interesting things. You notice uh, the place there's a, the, where the Golden Gate, the so-called Eastern Gate is. There really isn't. There's a one, first century gate there. 
but down where the temple is, there is behind that wall infrared evidence of another entrance. So that's the, the, the bread rock falls f f uh, far enough that you could build the temple to where it originally stood without touching the Temple Mount because it's low enough at altitude. I'm not suggesting I do this. It's just one proposal that is kind of interesting to throw up. Okay. One other thing I'd like to profile quickly for you. We studied Babylon when we were in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51. There would never again be inhabited after it's destroyed and, and uh, building material is not reused. This is a picture of Babylon today. Here's an aerial photograph. This is a city 55 miles south of Baghdad. Um, and uh, in this aerial photograph, you can see Saddam Hussein's palace that is prominent, the, the original rubble of the Tower of Babel. And if you blow that region up larger, you can see the processional way and the um, original um, palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And when you blow that up, it's uh, been rebuilt. Not completely, but it's substan it implies that it is yet to, re to reemerge to prominence in order to receive the judgment that occurs in Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah 50. So uh, this is interesting because it's on our horizon today. There are many people who think this is silliness. All we need to do is sit back and watch. Do your homework and see what happens. The museum where Nebuchadnezzar had the, the you know, the, the uh, things he took from the Jerusalem 70 years earlier before Belshazzar had his party and you know the story. Okay, the challenge. You and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than does about any other period of time in history including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's our preposterous challenge. To challenge a statement, I ask you to do two things. Find out what the Bible says and find out what is really going on. The more you know about both of those, the more you'll see a concurrent concurrence. We monitor strategic trends. We publish a news journal and I have a website that tries to monitor strategic trends. These are a few of them, the primary ones. They're all biblically relevant. They're also areas of intelligence gathering in terms of the changes occurring on our immediate horizon. It's, it isn't any one of them, it's all of them that orchestrate uh, the view that we're moving to an, horizon, uh, an exciting horizon. And uh, so with that, let's do two things. Study your Bible and make the effort to find out what's really happening. And you won't do that on the 10 o'clock news. You've got to do a little homework. But with the Internet and alternative press and other resources available to you, it's not hard to find out what's happening. But the more you know what's happening, the more exciting it is because we are moving into the final climax of human history. God bless you.